Yes, very warm welcome, dear guests, both online and offline at our Philosophischer Salon. So analog is the new organic farming, this is what some people say, and other people say actually we need more clever algorithms, we need more clever networking, this is the only way in which we can make the sustainable turnaround. But what's what? Because how can we how come that different groups in this joint movement which tries to work for a joint sustainable world uh, have such opposite uh, views of how we get to the sustainable world and we asked ourselves a question we wondered is it possible that techies and uh, you know people with an environmental background come from a different background because we have different ideas of how technology works how people work how society works as a whole and how we can combine all these pieces in the jigsaw in order to form a more sustainable world and is it possible that uh, due to these fundamental differences, sometimes we talk at cross purposes, actually we want to move into the same direction, but we are comparing apples and oranges and are completely misunderstanding each other. This is precisely the t topic we're going to delve into over the next 90 minutes in a fundamental discussion. We're going to look at the question, how digital will a genuinely sustainable society be in the future? On, in order to answer that question, renowned guest Yes, Alexander Shani uh, unfortunately can't be with us tonight. That means that we will have four panelists here on stage. First of all, I would like to welcome a guest, guest who joined us from Belgium, Christian Decker. And uh, he is a journalist and a publisher of a blog in, in Dutch, Netherlands, and Spanish. And uh, it's um, actually he is looking at what we can learn from old technologies for new sustainable concepts. So, very warm welcome, Chris De Decker. And the next panelist here on stage, Professor Dr. Harald Welzer. It's a great privilege for me to welcome you here tonight. He is the author and co-founder, as well as director of the NGO Futur 2. And that NGO tries to look at alternative uh, forms of uh, the economy and of lifestyles and how you can promote this. Apart from that, he is a professor for transformation design at the Europe uh, University in Flensburg. Very warm welcome, Professor Dr. Welzer. So, Harold. Okay, next guest, Professor Dr. Angelika Zand. Angelika, many of you will know her. She was the chairperson of the BUND, Environmental Association, and now she's an honorary chairperson. And for many years, she looked at the question how you can shape sustainability post-growth society and um, how can we harness this. Between 2001 and 2013, she was on the Council for Sustainable Development. And in 2011, she received an award in Germany for her commitment. And I think that that award which was presented to her like the order um, in Germany which is one of the highest orders the Federal Cross of Merit uh, is well deserved so very warm welcome Angelica and right to begin with I would like to be the agent provocateur and put a very heretic question maybe you can you know dream uh, in an ideal world, very often we as pragmatic people tend not to dream, we try to fight too much and we don't think enough about utopias. We don't dream dreams, but what about an ideal world? Let's imagine we woke, wake up 2035 and suddenly all what we ever fought for has become a reality. What happens if suddenly 2035, the 9 billion people on this planet, um, can enjoy the respect of their human rights, everybody has enough food, shelter, and they also have access to sound healthcare. 
So we, 2035, we're living in peace and prosperity and democracy, but that's not all. Greenhouse gases have gone down by 99.0%. 2035, ideal world. Let's dream the dream. The question is, how digital would such a kind of society be, from your point of view? And does that mean we need more digital tools, or does that mean this utopia would have room for more digital tools, or would it is maybe less more? Christian Decker, what's your take on that? Christian. Okay. <coughs> Just found the, the channel that um, <laughs> <laughs> speaks English, so I, I didn't get your got your question. Oh no! <laughs> okay, so. the, the question was: um, yeah. Imagine you uh, wake up in the year um, 20, uh, 2035, yeah. and everything is fine. We manage to um, get um, like the um, emissions down to. Um, yeah, 90, reduced by 90%, um, every, the world lives in peace and democracy, uh, everyone has um, access to healthcare and so on. Um, so we live in the perfect world. Um, how digital is this perfect world? Uh, probably less than today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and why is that so? Why? Um, uh, because uh, digital technologies has become more of a problem than a solution. And um, as we see now, like energy use keeps increasing uh, mainly through digitalization. Uh, not just computers and internet, but also we are kind of uh, putting chips everywhere. And um, yeah, for me, a sustainable future is a, is a future with less uh, digital technology but not without digital technology. Angelica, Angelica, what's your uh, what's your take on that? Uh, I would say I don't know because uh, nowadays you can't really see what the environmental implications of digitalization will be, how useful the applications are which are promoted now in the context of smart home, whether that trend can be continued at infinitum. And we don't know how the privacy issues will be resolved. I mean, right now we've got so many issues surrounding the topic of digitalization. And therefore, I'm not sure whether in that beautiful, brave new world which you pointed out, we will need more digital tools or less digital tools and I think this conference also serves the purpose of s resolving that question. Do digital tools help us uh, get closer to that future vision or does, does it divorce us from that? Or do we need to meter it carefully, namely take the best of it, take the positive aspects but do not succumb to excessive euphoria and think just because it's digital it's al already sustainable. Mr. Hetzer is already wringing his hands. Do you want me to continue? Okay. Actually, I tend to agree with Chris for a very simple reason. Very fundamental reason. A sustainable society needs to be a resilient society in the future. A sustainable society of the future needs to be capable of mastering ch crises, challenging crises, and especially it needs to be capable of handling crises, resolving crises in a peaceful manner. And digitization is actually a technology which tends to lead to more alienation, more dependence, less resilience, tends to promote less resilience. And therefore, I think it would be wise to come up with a, an idea of a sustainable world where digitalization is understood along the ter same terms as uh, something, uh, any other technology, like technology per se, is stupid, which can be either useful or useless, depending on the way in which a culture uses it. And whenever we think about a sustainable world, we need to think about sustainable tools. And the, under that premise, we can think about what is needed. I mean, I'm not an iconoclast. Under that that premise, we can think about ways in which digital technologies can be helpful uh, 
Indeed, um, you know, as a sustainable, democratic, uh, free society, I'm not a Luddite. Let me be the uh, put a provo provocative question. I think it's interesting that everybody agreed that future scenario will have less digitalization. And I also understand between the lines that apparently this digitalization, which we have now, does not lead to a more liberal society or more resilience or more democracy. But can't we think about different tools of, of digitalization? So maybe there is not one size fits all digitalization. I mean, after all, we're talking about bits and boima bits and trees where two things can come together for instance from the ccc community chaos computer club community there's a lot of open source developments empowerment uh, movements they bank on local structures uh, localization structures, initiatives which are divorced from big multinational companies. People try to uh, assume more control on over their own life, become more resilient. So, does it does not beg uh, a differentiation? I mean, it's not necessarily more digitization, which is evil, but maybe also the shape of digitization, which needs to be discussed. And resilient, but that's not really true because they use very large scale networks that they don't own themselves. So um, many of the things that I, I think you're like kind of uh, um, meaning like sharing economy and stuff like that, uh, they can be organized without digital technology also. You don't really need a smartphone to, uh, to share a car. There's other ways to do that. Um, so, but I think what you said was very interesting. It's about, um, so I'm not, I'm not a Luddite either. And um, I think it's important to think about what we need. And not so much, uh, it, now it's not about what we need, it's about what is possible. And anything that is techn technologically possible and commercially possible happens. There's no way of us kind of, a bit like the Amish do, like there comes a new technology and we, we test it for 10, 20 years and then we say, ah, it's good for a community or it's bad for a community. We don't do that. We kind of, without any criticism, we just swallow everything that's new and new is by definition better and that I think is, is the problem. Okay, let me double check. I think the car sharing example was an excellent one which you mentioned. Of course, you can organize car sharing di differently without the digital technologies. But I mean, right now you've gotten used to using your smartphone, just organizing it that way. And I mean, what, we're a creature of habit. Is it realistic that maybe we can come up with different solutions which make do without a smartphone? Will people have the same propensity to adopt it? Or but doesn't it just um, also require kind of dispensation? attitude, Calvinistic attitude. Um, I think you, we are creature of habits and indeed it's difficult to get unused to something. I mean, look at all the accoutrements of a car, all the bells and whistles, digital um, window lifts, you've got air con, you've got all the uh, digital bells and whistles in cars, driver assistance systems. So for people, it would be really a sacrifice if they suddenly would have to manually move the window up and down. But I don't know whether that's automatic. Is that really such a bad thing? But I think it's important to also embrace, to also be able to embrace non-digital alternatives. I mean, let's stick with the car example. I mean, I won't be able to get by a car without an aircon. And using the aircon in cars further leads to climate warming. And therefore, I personally, I'm a bit hesitant. Are we really that, should we really be so enthusiastic in di about digitization in wa walks of life? I mean, official politicians um, love it and they think to, it needs to be promoted. We In recent days, we heard about the fact that Germany needs to be number one in exports in digital inventions. And when it comes to artificial intelligence, that's the official government goal, because this is the only way we can show 
shore up jobs in Germany and can continue to grow in Germany. And in my view, um, people hijack digitalization by the existing growth ideology. And it's got it's given a prominent place in that official ideology. And the question is, is it a Pied Piper's dream? I mean, we've succumbed to it without actually wanting to succumb to it or because we actually want to embark upon a different economic development. But many people who applaud digitalization are loudest are the ones who obtain jobs and economic prosperity from it. But the question is, where do they take the figures from? Because there's also opposite statistics which point out quite to the opposite, i.e. that digitalization will come at the price of jobs. So it doesn't promote the labor market. And the question is, will we embrace digitalization if it, if it comes at the cost of jobs? And what are the ideas? In which way do we want to handle the implications of digitization as a society? And at the same time, in how far do we need to change the social uh, systems in order to make sure that all people would still have a livelihood or work? Let's get back to what Mr. Welzer said. He said, first of all, we need to think about sustainability and then ask ourselves, how do we get there? And if it's more digital or sustainable, then we need to, okay, adopt that tool, adopt that road. Yes, but maybe we can pick up uh, what's been uh, said in the two previous comments. I mean, a sustainable world, um, in my view, is a world where people work less than they do nowadays. That's my idea of a sustainable world. And here, okay, right away I have an element where I say, okay, incomes digitization, incomes technology, uh, and it's very handy in order to get rid of the ugly, dirty, bad work. Uh, so if we are suddenly faced with a new situation that the labor market has different outlines, takes a different shape and form, then we can start a social debate as to how we are going to fund the livelihood of human beings in that changed society. And suddenly we'd have a utopia, a very specific utopia, and uh, that means that livelihood and your well-being no longer depends on alienation. So with the tools of robots and automation, a society can afford afford to fund human beings for simply existing. And this would be quite a cool utopia. And if I remove this from gainful employment, I remove pressure from the system. Because right now, people need to compensate for what they do by consuming. Okay, I need to do bullshit the whole day. And the only way I can uh, kind of justify myself for that is by kind of uh, rewarding myself for that bullshit. But in other ways, uh, I need to think about digitalization, but always as a dependent variable. It's not an independent variable. The independent variable is that we won't be able to continue business as usual, the business we have right now through the 21st century. So we need to transfer radically transform transformed business as usual. And sooner or later, we can think about ways that will help us at the level of technology and the big shortcoming. And this is what also Chris pointed out quite rightly. The big problem is that we don't have any community, any social debate on whether we want this in, um, you know, in auditoriums. I don't well, I usually ask people who wants to sit in a self-driving car. Okay, there's always one person. Okay, point taken. But um, there's also some reasons for some people to do that. But personally, I have not come across any majorities who want to drive self-driving cars. Or oh, hardly anyone wants to live in a smart home. Nonetheless, every, wherever you look in broadsheet papers, it's always, oh, this is where the future lies, self-driving cars, smart homes, the future is smart city. And what is even worse, the infrastructure is created for that. The hardware is put into place without any sort social debate in our community. And, uh, you know, this one goes out to the uh, audience here. And this is why the conference is so important here today, because we actually need to debate this politically. But at that point, we also need to 
you know, uh, translate this from technology and bring it back into culture because at the end of the day, we are the ones who define what the good life is and it's not just some man in smoke-filled rooms. I mean, it's a male technology. I'm a feminist. Let me point this out. So it's a very male-dominated technology. So it's men who define this and we've got certain social precepts we, which we want to continue to develop. And um, then as a secondary line, we can say, okay, this is what we need to have in order to have this. Maybe we need to have fridges which uh, autonomously decides what I will have uh, for food for tomorrow. Can I go back to the fridge? I think that's a wonderful example. I'm sure f uh, a man came up with fridges. It's a male idea because usually women know what's on in the fridge and when the yogurt is about to go off, I think we'd be able to do without uh, aut aut digital fridges. But I'd like to get back to the question, what do we need digitization for and what do we need robots and self-driving cars for? Let me give you one example where, which I think is very crass, for instance, the field of application of healthcare robots. Oh, okay, point taken. Maybe this healthcare robot can do certain movements and it's got very soft uh, fingers and no longer that hard thing like in the old days and it can stroke old people. But I think that's a horror scenario. I mean, that uh, healthcare robot uh, then has its schedule and walks from one uh, room to the next and strokes old people, caresses old people, TLC, and it's got its voice control program. Uh, I think it better can be effective, but I think it's not in line with human dignity. It is not on. And we need to discuss this. And, um, you know, let me also mention an aspect from the environmental movement. It took quite a long time until we installed tools such as the technological impact assessment. There's an entire office for the technical impact, technological impact assessment. But I am not aware of any surveys in all fields of digitization which are quite as comprehensive concerning the implications. I mean, there anecdo there's anecdotal evidence, but I mean, it's a fundamental sea change in our society and therefore we would need a fundamental assessment with regard to the impact, both environmental impact, but also with regard to the social co coexistence, with regard to communication. I think we are embarking upon a major um, open-ended experience experiment where people just uh, paint uh, the Shangri-La on the horizon who actually benefit from that as a business business idea from digitization. Actually, this uh, took us to a very specific debate. Maybe we can take go off on a brief tangent for a minute and, you know, backpedal a little bit. I mean, I'm a techie. And I don't really think that this is necessarily a male hegemony or male domain. Some of the leading pioneers in, in coders, software programmers, were women. I grew up in a tech household, and my mom told me, you know, if something is broken, go downstairs to the basement and repair it yourself. But anyway, I'm wondering, how come? We have a fundamentally skeptical attitude when it comes to technology. I must say I'm a digital native. I've got difficulties in understanding this. I think tech as both a risk and an opportunity. And when we prepared the panel, we wondered. We asked ourselves, how come people are so concerned when it comes to technology and even reject it? And in the environmental scene or green scene, people are very critical when it comes to technology. And there's no two ways about it. I think quite partly it's correct, but on the other hand, I think it's partly also exaggerated and it's just a knee-jerk response. Eventually, we'll find out that there is a lot of literature text describing what it will look like the day we'll opt out. Walden by Henry David Thoreau was published in 18. 50, he describes his life in the mountains of Massachusetts, where he lived for a long time. Now, I do see your skeptical faces, but I'm pretty sure you do the same. And my question for you is, what is the good life, the right life, the sustainable life? 
And doesn't our attitude, our view with respect to society shape our approach with respect to technology? Aren't we skeptical for this very purpose? Aren't we believing that we can move forward with less technology? I mean, nine billion people will be living on this planet soon. How can we feed all these people? Will it work? Well, now, I am surprised. That's uh, apparently an extraordinary idea you have of the environmental movement. You seem to think that we want to have everybody move to the forests like a Soro and build wooden houses. Yeah, but we don't want to have robots take care of us one day exclusively. Yeah, but then you can save quite a bit if you use robots for this purpose, nursing robots. This here. Um Die Umweltbewegung ist entstanden äh, im 19. Jahrhundert, als die Industrialisierung einsetzte, äh, hat sich auch sehr viel an Now back to the question, why are people skeptical? There's a lot of criticism of dams, of the destruction of natural landscapes, which are used for industrial sites, mining, for example, the complete destruction of whole mountains. There was a lot of resistance in the past with the idea of protecting nature and which was also inspired by a very ascetic approach and which also was inspired by a certain rejection of a technological approach. So these were the beginnings, but then of course there was also the attempt to deal with technology under the heading of atomic energy. And people were criticizing that nobody had assessed the risks before building nuclear power plants. There was a lot of resistance, which fortunately found a lot of support in society. There are other fields where people, where the ecological movement is still active. The nuclear energy issue is still an issue today and other interventions in nature have also triggered a lot of resistance. But the idea that the eco-movement does not want digitization is not true. Maybe this is the case with the older ones, but when I prepared for tonight's debate, and I'm just back from the BUND delegates meeting, and I have talked to 150 delegates, but too many. And I realize that there is no lump sum rejection of a technology or digitization. It always depends on the field of application. It's not the technology people are against. It's what the technology is being used for, what they criticize or discuss. So there is a certain affinity with respect to digitization in the environmental movement, which is no different from the population at large. On the one hand, because we are also using digital means for our own activities, be it marketing, be it mailings, be it campaigns and mobilizations, we are present on Facebook and so on. And that's necessary because that's the only possibility we have to reach out to many people at the same time. It's much more efficient than just standing in the streets with leaflets as we did 30 years ago. So we are actively involved. We are digitizing too. And that's very different from genetic engineering, for example. We do reject genetic engineering as such. But this conference here is also meant to differentiate and to talk about different communities and how they digitize in order to be a bit more realistic in the images we produce. This conference 
and there is to be a follow-up, is also focusing on an exchange about the purpose of digitization and whether it's useful or not. And it's also about the framework conditions we need. We need to understand each other and we need to communicate much better than we used to. So that's very different from these pictures from the Canadian forests or the horror images of technical devices. We are trying to work on a common future. And of course, we need to discuss the extent to which we digitize or technologize. <laughs> yeah, <klar. laughs> Herr Welzer, was sagen Sie? Mr. Welzer, what do you say? Doing away with technology, I mean, is this an intentionally exaggerated picture of the eco-movement? Would you say that it's good to refuse or reject technology or digitization? I think this discussion is problematic anyway. Because if you look at the history of the modern ecological movement, you realize that this is a movement which pursued a fundamental societal change. And it has become a very technological movement. We wouldn't have any renewable energies, for example, without the eco-movement, wind power. That's what we took from the anti-nuclear movement that's not from the studios of engineers. So you truly have to look at the history and you need to understand what the history of the eco-movement is. And this is also the history of civilizational progress. Like, we need to feed 9 billion people. Why do we need to feed 9 billion people? because the history of industries and societies has increased the life expectancy and has reduced the mortality of children. So nobody would go and say technology is bad and sorrow is the utopia. We are living in a world which is characterized by technological infrastructures. And what is certainly different from the artistic worlds, it has created itself. So it's not as easy as a picture in which you have, on the one hand, the ecos, and on the other hand, the techies, or on the one hand, technology, and on the other hand, resistance. We live in a world which we can shape, and this is what it's all about right now. And this gets me back to the technic theme or technology theme. If, if you open a newspaper and look at the sciences pages, you realize that we are not lacking a technology euphoria in society. No way. But we do lack the political criticism of the current transformation of society. And this is not an impact of the technology as such, but of the use or implementation of a technology or technologies for the purpose of surveillance, for the purpose of conditioning so that people buy even more shit in spite of the fact that they don't even want what they buy. Now, these are the politically relevant applications of technology in the capitalist development we are experiencing right now. This is not about technology. This is not against technology. But this is against the shaping of the political sphere in which we move. And that's 
the decisive bit. And this is, so to speak, the basis on which we need to discuss the question of digitization. What does freedom mean? What does privacy mean? What does participation mean? These are the questions we need to ponder so that we go in the end and say that a technology which is alienating and which takes our autonomy away from us and which makes us more conform is not the technology I want in the society I want to have in the end. So technology as such is good, but not for itself. Yeah, Stichpunkt, um, Stichwort, um, Wachstum. The gross society is my buzzword. Now we are living in a world based on permanent growth. In spite of the fact that we've talked for decades about the question whether this planet can cope with so much growth at all, or whether we are destroying the planet by going for ever more growth. So the question is, how can societies degrow? Can we achieve a post-growth society? And what about digitization in such a society, digitization which covers ever more fields of our lives? I mean, we are using these technical devices, smartphones, the mic I'm holding in my hand. I mean, somehow people have to produce these devices and people make money by producing them and they need to make money in order to make a living. So don't we have to talk about the economic system as such in order to get these two worlds together? Well, first of all, there are, um, um, say, analog alternatives for microphones, so it's not really, really necessary. Um, and before that, I wanted to go back to your, your earlier question, because I found it, um, sorry to do that, but I, I could not really answer. I found it strange that you said that, um, I, I mean, my whole work is, is actually a critique on the fact that the, the green community has become so fixed on technology. Uh, it's renewable energy, energy efficiency computers, and, and in the 70s, for instance, the environmental community was still talking about uh, changing our way of life and reducing energy use, and it seems to be forgotten, but that was the before. Um, so what was the new question? <laughs> I mean, um, you use for your um, yeah for your low tech magazine also yeah. a lot of technology. For example, it's, I uh, found it interesting to hear that you have a website which is only online when the sun is shining enough to um, provide power yeah, for your for solar example. cells. Um, but I mean, when we talk about a um, yeah, sustainable digital society, um, also we need to assume that somewhere, somehow, these digital um, or these high-tech goods need to be produced by some, someone. And what are the conditions? Yeah. Or should we not also talk about um, yeah, economy? Yeah, of course. But uh, what I learned is, uh, because my blog is focused on technology, but of course, it's all about economy, but I have learned that um, it's easier to make people uh, understand something if you talk about concrete things. If you, if you talk about a smartphone, everybody knows what, what you're talking about. And economy is a very abstract thing. So you can have all these ideas about economies, and it's very difficult to kind of... Um, people cannot really imagine how a different economy would look like. Uh, but if you, if you tell them which kind of technologies they're going to use in this new world, then, then it becomes feasible to them. For example, if there's no more planes, but there are uh, like night trains all over Europe, for example. Um, uh, if there's no microphones, but acoustical systems. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, it's easier to talk about technology. It's more, it, it works better to talk about concrete things. And, um, of course, we have to change the economic system because it's the, it's the basis of the, of the mess we are in. And uh, so why do you see uh, microchips uh, showing up everywhere in every product? It's because the microchip industry needs new markets all the time. And there's no other reason than that. 
So um, economic growth is, is the main uh, problem. And of course you can have an economy without, uh, without growth and we, can, we have so much. Uh, it's like you said, uh, we, we could work three hours a week and, and we have enough to, uh, yeah, to survive. So, um, yeah, that's the, that's the challenge. Ja, ich möchte doch noch mal dem I would like to object, I would like to present a different picture of the eco-movement because this is not only about renewables or wind energy and this is not about sufficiency anymore for the new eco-movement. This is only about adequate new technologies. I mean, this is maybe true for parts of the Green Party, but in the eco-movement as such, it's not true. And in the BUND, we have just raised the question of lifestyles, because this is not only about efficient products. It's good to have efficient pro products, but you need to know how to deal with them in a smart way. And you shouldn't buy as many of them as possible only because they are efficient, right? So, in the more recent past, in the ecological or environmental movement, the focus has shifted a bit. And we are now also supporting sustainable technologies, they help us save resources, but then, and that's even more important, we need to ask the question, what do I need, how much of it do I need, and when do I need it? This is the question we need to put in the focus, because this is about affordability. This is what the environmental movement can do, because the movement doesn't sell any products, and it doesn't have to be the growth economy, which is the engine, the motor of our society. But that's the problem. Actually, that's the problem because here you withdraw from the question of sustainability and a pacified sustainability and a pacified capitalism. Is there such a thing as a sustainable pacified capitalism? Capitalism has offered a number of good things, of benefits, of achievements, but the interesting bit about the history of the eco-movement is that it was not about sufficiency in the beginning. It was about a different society. I remember Rudolf Barrow and many others who, at the beginning of the movement, offered perspectives. And the idea was always the transformation of society. Society was to be a society focusing on the non-destructiveness of its very core. The society we wanted to have was a society, was a society which would not destroy. Now, the eco-movement, and that's quite clear now, has moved away from this particular position and it stopped raising these societal questions. It has gone and replaced those questions by technical devices, by technologies, and the romantic idea of a culture of sufficiency, which is a contradiction as such and in itself. It doesn't work. It simply doesn't work because the eco-movement was so successful, the people are getting mixed messages. On the one hand, everybody is told to act responsibly, responsibly and to be aware of the need for sustainability. And on the other hand, 24 by 24, 7 by 7, they get the message, go and buy. And that's the key motif. That's the motor, the engine, the main driver of society, and I cannot withdraw to a point in society in which I go and say, within the system of go and buy, I need to tell people to act sufficiently. I mean, in, in, apart from the fact that people don't understand because they don't know what sufficiency is, it doesn't work. Well, there are more people who know what sufficiency is today. And the philosophy of the good life which is, so to speak, the idea of sufficiency, slower, better, less. There are lots of synonyms for the idea of sufficiency have found a way into society, but 
You are right. There is this growth program, and sufficiency is also part of the growth program because I'm not telling people don't go and buy, uh, don't go and stop buying, but I'm telling people go only what you truly need or try and figure out whether you can do or produce things yourself. Repair cafes, for example, they get support from municipalities and local authorities as long as this is a niche which does not put capitalism at stake. These initiatives get support. But if everybody goes and says, well, should I really go and buy? No, I will only buy what I need. It gets dangerous. And I don't buy a new car just because it's nicer or more beautiful. This is being understood as a kind of refusal opting out of consumption, that is. But if everybody did it, it would be much less harmless as it seems to be with all these niches, urban gardening, repair cafes, you name it. Put the responsibility with the individuals and it seems like you have the freedom to not use these technologies. But I can tell you, I'm living without a smartphone and every day it gets harder because I cannot, uh, I have to pay extra for train tickets and, and uh, there's more and more things depending on, on smartphones. I miss uh, uh, half of, of the modern uh, life. And uh, then you can say to people, yeah, you should, you should be responsible and not buy these things, but the world, the system evolves toward needing it, needing a car, needing a smartphone and so on. So it's not about um, telling people uh, or expecting people to, to change their behavior or something. It's, it, it's not going to work like that. Yeah, Well, I forgot something really important, uh, namely that indeed it is very important that the individual are prepared to ask themselves that question. What do I need? What is redundant? Of course, that is important, but the be all and end all is that uh, the responsibility for a sufficient and low resource uh, life does not reside within the individual, but it's incumbent upon politicians to set a right, a favorable climate environment. So I don't need a car so I can drive public transport, so I've got a cycling pass and I can uh, ride my bike. So first of all, the infrastructure needs to be in place and uh, I need to have an environment which doesn't force me into buying by a constant barrage of advertising. I need to have bans in inner towns. I need to have bans in on public broadcasting stations for advertising. So basically, it's the role of politicians to, set, to create the uh, environment for a lifestyle which can make do with less. And the other thing is that we need to continue to have alternatives uh, where we can continue to move without digital devices and feel at home in that society, not feel an outsider, and that we still have options to make do without these things, to have social contacts. I mean, if I don't no longer have any telephone booths in town, then I won't be able to make do without a smartphone at all. So I get completely lost because uh, I don't have a smartphone. <laughs> okay, but let's get back to where we started. To begin with, there was a utopian question. Um, we were asked to imagine what it felt like uh, to wake up in the year 2035. And now let's pick up on this uh, in light of what we just discussed. Actually, it's a contradiction of the system. So if we think there is a sustainable global culture, let's assume there's a sustainable global culture in 2035 and uh, there are communities all over the world who embrace a sustainability and live accordingly so in that case uh, right now we have no social utopia at all which we could follow because right now we are faced with a very very basic conundrum in terms of our lifestyles it's a choice between uh, poverty low life expectancy a low carbon footprint or we have the civilization achievements and uh, we have a big carbon footprint so it's the choice between the devil and the deep blue sea and that means that right now 
We lack a social utopia which embraces the civilization uh, achievements of capitalist societies and can preserve it on the basis of a different form of management of, uh, of the economy. And this is the fundamental question which we need to discuss. And we're not discussing behavioral issues and I need to instruct people, teach people to buy less. In terms of the system, inherently, you won't do that. And this is exactly where Chris is right, because all the parameters of our daily existence are geared towards this non-sustainable path. And uh, we have no um, counter narration, social counter narrations, which induces people to embrace a different lifestyle. That's an interesting point you're mentioning. The assumption that people uh, are prone to change their behavior is something that reverberates in both movements. Data privacy uh, movement says, OK, you move to low data services. I personally do this, or many others don't do this. And in the environmental movement, the plea is, OK, move to alternative uh, uh, services. The consumer can vote with their purse or with their wallet. Now, in the tech movement, I observe something that is very characteristic. Uh, we have many projects in the tech movement which look at sufficiency or more equitable distribution of resources, which also look at democracy, which offer excellent solutions. Open source software, publicly available, jointly development, they are not owned by any multinational company, but there's hardly anyone who uses it because the assumption is, OK, there's a problem. You tackle it as a nerd, and you resolve it as a nerd. And I've got a good solution. I present it. I put it up online and hope that all rationally think, rationally minded people will embrace that solution. But there is a small hiccup here. And we also know this from the environmental movement. Just because an argument advise, it does not necessarily heed it. So common sense is the least common of all. And uh, you know, the same applies uh, to the uh, general public. And what can we learn from the environmental movement when it comes to convincing so society and uh, politicians and how we hack them? And isn't that a decisive question when we think about ways in which we can join both worlds in which we can um, embrace tech technologies which uh, spell a more sustainable life and roll them out on a large scale. May I answer? Because I'm having a difficult time with your language. You said we can hack society. The most successful social movements were, so, so, were successful because they were capable of creating systemic disturbances. Labor movement was successful because they invented strikes. Factories don't work if workers don't go there to work. So um, we would never have had certain progress in the social system unless the players uh, had uh, refrained from political action and used these tools to disturb the system. Sorry, comes off mic, can't be interpreted. So the unions come in, etc., what have you. So after spontaneous movements, suddenly they form into unions. So now later you get code denomination and etc., what have you. But it only works if those people who want to change society uh, want to reach more equity and if they s disturb the system and that would be a cool approach especially also for bits and bombs where can we identify potential for system disturbance by those who want to use technology differently so what is your leverage here for instance, with regard to sustainability, our hands are fairly tied. We are rather cobbled when it comes to systemic disturbance. Therefore, we use rational arguments and we try to use logic. But as I said before, common sense is the least common at all, common of all. And you don't write history with common sense, uh, you know. Uh, using common sense makes sense wherever you legitimize your political action. But it, common sense will never be able to replace political action. And maybe this would be a good outlook for this conference and for anything that can come forth from it. How can we exercise um, or generate social power? 
by embracing a joint thought on digitization and uh, sustainability, because the sustainability freaks have no bargaining power. This bargaining power, no chips you can use. And uh, the same applies to student strikes. Nobody is interested in whether students study or not. I mean, nobody's, nobody gives gives anything about student strikes. So that would be an interesting question for the politicization of the digitization question. What are the tools of articulation of power? What are the forms of disturbing the system that are available to the movement in order to take that movement to the next political level? I think that would be an interesting question. Allow me to take umbrage and to agree to disagree. The environmental movement, uh, well, you said it doesn't have any bargaining power and it's, you know, powerless, toothless. I don't really agree with you. Um, look at the environmental movement and look how powerful they protested against the deforestation in the Hambach forest close to Aix-la-Chapelle. Uh, Aix I mean, that wasn't toothless. That really created a massive political and social echo. Luckily enough, the court then uh, ruled that uh, people were not allowed to cut the trees down. But, um, you know, the uh, media attention which the resistance against the lignite mining had a lot of political clout and it accelerated the phase out, the coal phase out. I don't think we're toothless. I don't think we're, you know, just. Uh, no, I'm not arguing against the environmental movement. I mean, they're all swell. They're super, super duper, apart from the fact that the bargaining power of uh, people who squatted on trees were just due to the idiocy of RWE. Okay, from Hambaha Forest to Google and Facebook. So what does that mean? So let's translate that, that political action. Sorry, comes off my company interpreter. Interpreters can only interpret what they hear, and there's no sound fit without a mic. Um, yes, but I'm I'm just a stupid social scientist or humanities uh, scholar, and uh, um, you know. Therefore, I can't present you with a tool which can create systemic disturbance. I'm ignorant. I am ignorant in that respect in terms of technology. By the way, I don't have a smartphone. We are the two last dinosaurs on this planet Earth. I don't have a smartphone either. So it's like, um, you know, Asterix and Obelix is like a small Gallic city or town. But I articulated the idea that exactly at that point of cooperation or of the joint political um, deliberation, we should think about ways in which we can come up with an alternative form of p protest of effective and efficient political action. And that's exactly the contribution of those people who are more savvy with regard to digitalization than, you know, smart others like myself. I mean, I mean, uh, what am I supposed to do against school? You can't ask me what tools can I avail myself of against Google. Okay, with regard to the environment, with regard to many environmental issues, um, you can't preach one thing and do another thing. So basically, whenever I go to the BUND, um, I see recycled paper, um, I see many sustainable resources that were being used here in the office because they say, okay, if we uh, lobby um, a more a lower carbon footprint, then we also need to practice this. But what does this mean if we say we want sustainable digitization? Does that mean like as a movement in foot or tour or low tech blog or BUND, you say, okay, we use certain technologies and we stay away from di certain services. It's not just about technologies, it's about certain services. So what about the credentials, sustainability credit credentials? So we launched this debate in the BUND and we embrace open source. We use open source, but having said that, we are active on Facebook and Twitter and we also use Google. And I was also explained why this it was necessary after all. And we also have Outlook because it's easier. 
and this is where the bureau you know with linux there's too many problems and not enough people who are savvy with regard to linux and uh, there's lots of arguments and I was, I'm not capable of checking whether they are valid or not. So lots of point in case. So, but basically, um, people are facing that issue and they try their best, at least with regard to clouds. So they don't just try to get the certifications. I think the discussion is mispremised, absolutely mispremised, to be honest. I think we need to take this to a political level socio-political level and therefore it's pointless if we on the panel you know roll this over yeah but you said you don't have a smartphone and you uh, throw it in as an argument and therefore i was just wondering can't we just say in other areas i'm not going to use different services or use alternatives and lead by example or do you think it's pointless comments of mike can't be interpreted I don't fly, I don't have a car, uh, I don't have a heating system. I kind of try to live like it's more or less the 19th century, except for the things that I really need, like I need the internet, because otherwise I cannot uh, sell my story. And um, people always think that I do that to sh kind of give an example, and partly it's true, but for me it's mainly like to uh, uh, research, to investigate how far my freedom goes. Like, what can I change myself? And then it quite, like, if you don't fly, you need a lot of money, because if you want to take the train, it's very expensive. Um, so I think it's possible, and I find it funny that you are kind of like trying to show that you use technology while I am kind of doing the opposite. Um, so uh, I think there is a lot to, to win in um, trying to show that you can, I mean, I don't want to go back to the Middle Ages, but there is a way in between, like uh, you can live with much less technology and much, much less energy and still be a modern human being. And I, I think there is a, a chance to kind of um, show what is possible and also because, and why is that? Because many of our technologies are so extremely wasteful, so inefficient, that there's a lot of room for, for doing with much less and, and uh, showing that you can have a modern life with maybe one tenth or one hundredth of the resources we use now. And that's what I'm trying to do with the block, to show that you can do it. For instance, I'm, I don't have a heating system, but I'm not cold because I have my thermal underwear, I have my uh, heated carpets and everything. Uh, so there's a, by focusing on the technology, I, I notice that you can give people a kind of future society, image of a future society, that they kind of say like, hey, that's, that's not bad actually. So that's... I think my um, my intention. Okay, do you want to say something besides? Uh, actually, I wanted to one uh, wanted to ask whether we involve the audience. Timon, is the mic open? Hello. Yes, it is. Okay, questions from the audience. Unfortunately, we need to wrap up on time. So that means we've got 15 more minutes for questions from the audience. So my proposal is the following. You just request the floor. Tillman will come with the microphone. Let's start ladies first. For me, it's... It's not a question how we stop Google or Facebook. For me, the question is how do we find the objectives where we want to be? Which kind of energy consumption we want to avoid by ridiculous use of digital technology? How can we protect environment by using digitalization in a smart way for monitoring finding problems? What is our imagination to have a really climate smart resilient food system which is more than just cutting emissions by a livestock farm by 5%? And these are the questions that I hope we start with this Congress here today and tomorrow to go ahead. And also for me, sufficiency 
is much more than a lifestyle concept. For me, sufficiency is one of the most radical capitalism challenging concepts that I'm aware of. Because if you think it to the end, it means you need to rethink all the assumption how economy works. It's not only how you produce it, it's how you consume it, what do you do after the product. And for me, it also includes the digital sphere, and for me, the way forward is bring together the movements, the data movements, the food movement, the environment movements. Where are we strengths? What can we learn from each other? Where we get inspiration? And then we find distractions for capitalism. We pull the resources for, or the, the requests first. Uh, maybe put questions. Okay, gentlemen over here. In the introduction, luckily enough, you also mentioned the term health, health care. I think um, in the entire conference, we haven't spoken about enough about health care. And for people from the healthcare sector, the big question is, does digitalization make us healthier human beings, so both us and the world, because we shouldn't only look at ourselves, but also we should also look at the overall planet. I think in the labor world, digitization dispenses with a social recognition, so you become dehumanized uh, through digitization. And uh, therefore, I feel that the healthcare sector should be given a higher profile. It should be put on the radar. Directly in the healthcare sector, digitization is rather a source of concern. For instance, think of the ICU, or intensive care units, where algorithms decide on which intervention is going to be done and which one is not going to be done. And I was just wondering, why don't you discuss the healthcare sector more? And one final question. Maybe we can move over there. Maybe, ladies. It's just an idea which has been haunting me, differentiation of technology. I think we should single it out. So first of all, we can talk about a tool. And on the other hand, we can talk about machines which are supposed to, supposed to replace human beings. And whenever we talk about computers, you have exactly that. So. So we've got uh, stupid work and therefore you use computers. Uh, but in many respects, human replacement machines are, are not really related to digitization. So you can also have TVs as human replacement machines or dolls as human replacement uh, machines. And uh, this begs the question, is that a meaningful differentiation for our problem? Thank you very much for this question. Thank you. So do, do we want to start with the first question or the first uh, impression? The, the impression was or interjection, is it legitimate that, uh, I mean, sufficiency is the most fundamental criticism of critique of capitalism and do we need more of that? Do we need to become more fundamental? Sufficiency is a thorn in the side of capitalism and it uh, just remains to be seen whether that uh, you know uh, a thorn in the side actually makes uh, capitalism slow down so i mean if it it does that uh, well in a radical way it will be hardly compatible with uh, capitalism as we know it today but it's definitely meaningful to start to fetter the forces of capitalism by reducing consumption, not just at the individual level, but also uh, by uh, engaging in the respective sufficiency policy or politics. Uh, it's slightly contradictory, but I've got no idea uh, as to how you could fetter capitalism or get closer to the demise of uh, capitalism. But I think there's no panacea, there's no silver bullet for capitalism, but at least it's one approach as to how you can make headway. Let me also comment on the second question, because I health care. I mean, that, that was the, that's the opposite of uh, capitalism, I guess. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I know it's not the right place to say these words, but... Um, <laughs> but <the c> <laughs> 
But I mean, um, if, if you say that in the States, you're, you're probably really literally dead, but um, uh, it is, there is a system that, that kind of is the opposite of, of capitalism. And um, yeah, I think the, the, what, what you were saying also, we should uh, kind of disturb the system, but that, that has become very hard because we have become very individualistic and we have lost our community. And you see it even in, in things like the tiny house movement, which is a sustainability kind of fetish, but it's again very individualistic. And what we need is to come together, go live together in buildings, share uh, uh, kitchens, share bathrooms, uh, share, share housing. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> and, and that doesn't mean, I'm not, I'm not saying we should go, uh, I'm not, uh, I was in the, in the USSR before, uh, 89, so that's not the, the world I am, uh, I'm desiring, but I think there is, a, there is another way to do things, and, uh, maybe there is a way in between, so, yeah, well, shoot me. Yeah, so second Frage, sollten wir vielleicht mehr über The second question was whether we should talk about health more. And you also talked about the bots already, the nursing or the caring bots. Uh, I think there are a number of people who say I prefer a bot to a human being because this is a very private need I have. And I mean, this might sound provocative, but it's not bad, I think, to have the option to decide whether you want a human being or a robot. A robot. The question is, what are the topics we don't talk about sufficiently? Now, I don't know whether we talk about he this topic here at the conference sufficiently or not. I think you will have to assess it afterwards. But healthcare is certainly a field in which you can clearly show that a new technology and its implementation changes views and visions. We do have a number of insurances and you have permanent tracking. The behavior of human beings is being tracked all the time. Now, since this is legally difficult, there are bonus systems offered by the insurance companies. In other words, the society is changing all the time. And we used to have a system of solidarity or based on solidarity in the health insurance world in the past. And today it's about performance and services you buy. And this should be talked about. Now, people also talk about medical diagnostics, the AI approach, as they call it. And this can do a lot also in terms of substituting for medical competence and doctors. Now, we know that statistically based analyses are being implemented. And what used to be medical intuition and a conversation with the patient and a knowledge of the patient and a face-to-face -face relationship becomes less important. But there is no a societal discourse. People go and say, it's much better. It's quite nice to use your app and take a picture of your skin cancer and send it to a doctor. And then he just tells you what to do. Or you send it to the pharmacy, whatever. Now, health is a key area where our world is changing and fundamental values of our world are changing. It's an important example because this is one of the key fields that are being opened in order to undermine the fundamental values of our societies. But I don't know whether this is being discussed here sufficiently or not. For bits and trees, it's certainly an important topic. Health care or the health system. Well, this is one of the few growth markets 
the pharmaceutical production and medicine based on diagnostic technology. And of course, the health system is also sponsored socially by the government. But on the other hand, this is also based on a reorientation. And I think we need to focus on prevention much more instead of having ever more machines and automats who help people ex post, so to speak, and not in a preventive approach. However, prevention doesn't pay. There are sports clubs and a few therapists maybe who make money by offering prevention, but otherwise prevention does not really matter. And this gets me back to the growth society, because if you want to have a society which is more than a repair shop, we need to focus on prevention too. The last question was about the differentiation between the human being and the Ersatz machine. If you don't want to answer this question, I'd like to invite the audience again. We have time for two more questions. Well, we need to talk. This is what we are here for, bits and trees. That's about being together. Freedom, free spaces, democracy, sustainability, and good work need to be seen in one of the same context. Self-determination is a buzzword. And what does open source mean with respect to bits and with respect to trees? We know it from the patents. The market economy doesn't work as a social market economy any longer. It's only about privatization. It's not about health, it's about profit. Can we use the technology for the purpose of health in order to improve the situation in our health system? Or does it only help the industry where our lives our life is about scores only. The question is, how do we organize freedom? What about the framework conditions? Hello, Hans Herzog aus Österreich here. Um, when man das Thema Digitization, once you look at it, is about data exchange. Now, if we consider data exchange in the context of sustainability, I wonder what does it mean? What about networking, cooperation, and the connection with what we have now in order to trigger effects? There are potentials, I think. Why don't we use them? That's my question for you. Should we become members of the traditional parties, the FDP, the Liberal Party, the Christian Democratic Party, in order to destroy the system, I wonder? Let's start with the first question. Shouldn't we talk about what we share instead of talking about what separates us? I think this wasn't a question, it was a comment. And we all agreed here on the panel. This is the first conference of its kind, and we need to double check what the political intention of the conference is. So I do agree to the first statement. As far as the Liberal Party is concerned, it might be too hard for most of us probably to become a member, but if you want to act subversively, small parties aren't a bad thing. So you might even ponder the SPD. Now I skipped the question in between, I forgot it. This was about networking. Do we have to network? Well, Honestly, I'd be skeptical. Shouldn't we take stock 
and check what the better possibilities of communication are and what this means for the implementation of sustainability. Has it been successful, efficient? This is clearly an important question. And we need to find out what truly matters. Because in general, we need to ask, what do the technological possibilities mean in the context of social transformation and for social movements? What have we achieved? People tend to say the Arab Revolution or the Arab Spring time and again. That's the only known example so far. I think it makes sense to talk about the question, what have we achieved thanks to the technological approach these days? It might be useful to ponder this question furthermore. The Liberal Party, the FDP, would be a real problem for me. I still remember their posters in the election campaign digitization first and we might ponder the question whether it's problematic or not later they said so i would not be capable of bearing being a member of the fdp now what about sustainability and technology i think a lot is moving a lot is happening and many initiatives and groups have benefited from technology in order to establish connections with groups in other parts of the world, with groups in developing countries, also for pay PR activities. It's been very important to make things public works well if you have the technological devices and means. And also if you want to launch petitions with the EP, we couldn't do it without digital means, or it would be much more difficult. Collecting signatures, I mean, nobody would be interested in this particular means. So if we want to protest against a certain program launched by a certain minister, we couldn't do it without online petitions, for example. It's not always efficient, but it's certainly a means to express our protest. Otherwise, there are lots of ways we see in order to work efficiently, we can use technology in order to measure the nitrate content of waters or knocks in streets, which also helps people who are active, voluntary volunteers who work in political groups which try to exercise pressure on politicians so that things happen. This is also about being a citizen. Uh, die Wissenschaft in um voranzubringen, sowohl was Natur angeht, wie auch im Umweltschutz. Now talking about nature and environmental protection, this is certainly also a means to help us act in the political field efficiently. It also shows us that there are a number of possibilities in the field of traffic and transport, for example. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Examples of technologies and how they help you but, and how they have improved things. But at the same time, these same technologies also help the enemy, the others, the other side, the corporations. They get bigger and bigger because of the communication systems. And they also, they get like, uh, they can uh, keep an eye on everyone. So it's not, it's a sword with, uh, it cuts both ways. So it's not really... It's not much use that we have better technology because they have the same technology and they also became more powerful and probably more even than that. Um, yeah, so. Aber wenn wir sie nicht nutzen würden. Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. She says. If we would not. If, uh, if, if we would not. 
and less and then would use them. Also. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not so sure, actually. I mean, if we would stop using the, the, those technologies, they can also not monitor us, you know? <laughs> so, um, so I guess it there might is be not... worthwhile to, to try the opposite uh, strategy. I mean, it would make just as much sense, actually. Thank you very much for Thank you very much for listening. We have reached the end of our program. So... Enjoy the party. I hope you'll stay. And we'll be back tomorrow with Bits and Trees. Thank you and good night.